Baptist Church, and it is so wonderful to see you all worshiping with us here this morning on this Pentecost Sunday. Also, it is uh, aside from Pentecost, it is also our Confirmation Sunday. So for all of you uh, folks, families who, uh, uh, of the Confirmands who are joining us to support these young people making a very big decision this morning, we thank you so much for being here. Uh, will you all please stand for our opening hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Summer is now beginning. I'm sure uh, the young folks in here are very well aware of that. Uh, we have a variety of ways and new activities to get to know everybody else here at the church. Uh, build some community, have some fun times together. Uh, we're going to let you know about these opportunities here this morning. Uh, the first is that we're going to be doing a couple summer, uh, summer trivia nights. I'm a big trivia buff myself, and I'll be putting these together. Uh, the first one that is coming up is on Friday, June 17th at 7 p.m. It is team trivia, so if you want to bring your family, bring some friends, we're shooting for teams of between four and eight people, and I'll tell you this, it pays to have a breadth of ages on your team. Some of the questions the younger folks might know a little easier, some of the questions the older folks might know a little bit easier, so you're definitely incentivized to uh, bring along some grandparents or grandkids to help you out and to get you thinking about this. I have a trivia question for you all that if you think you know the answer, come find me after the service and I'll tell you if you got it right. Here's the question. What international company manufactures more rubber tires each year than any other company? It's not necessarily what you'd think it would be. So be thinking about that one during the service and come find me after uh, if you'd like to hear the answer. Uh, for our trivia nights, there will be a Star or Starbucks gift cards for the winning team, so these are very high stakes. You better bring your thinking caps for that. Uh, next up, we want to mention that uh, Carrie Lee, one of our Christian education directors, and Alicia McGlone are both starting a summer moms group for moms in the church to get to know one another and maybe spend some time together while their kids are playing. Uh, the group is going to be starting on Monday, June 27th at 10 a.m. here at the church. Uh, if you want to participate, but maybe that time doesn't work for you, you can't do uh, Mondays during the morning, uh, please shoot an email to Carrie and Alicia uh, as they're trying to find a time that works best for everybody. That time is subject to change if there's a different time during the week that everybody might find a little easier. Finally, we want to mention uh, the first in a series of family fun nights is going to be on Saturday, June 18th, starting at 6 p.m. Uh, each family fun night will have food and activities for all ages. Uh, these are great opportunities to come, invite a friend, 
uh, and have a great time building community and getting to know one another. We'll have games for the kids, maybe a movie night here and then. Uh, just be on the lookout for some of these summer events that are coming up here this, this summer. We've got a lot of fun things planned. Also, one other thing I wanted to mention very quickly is today was the day that our fellowship time uh, in the fellowship hall began. So if you're coming to the 11 o'clock service regularly and, and want to get here a little early, get some coffee, get some snacks, talk to some of the other people here in the church, we recommend you do so. Uh, all of that is set up in the fellowship hall for the time between our 930 and 11 o'clock services. So it'd be wonderful to see you there and uh, engage in some community building here at the church. Now, before we hear the sermon this morning, will you all please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together and worship you. We thank you for all of these wonderful confirmands and the, their families and the mentors that have helped them uh, through these last several months of this confirmation class. And we're so looking forward to that ceremony later in the service this morning. I pray that as Pastor John gives us this message, that you inspire his words, that you uh, let his words be your words. And in your son's name we pray. Amen. You know, you know Dirk is a pretty amazing man. Pastor Simone, uh, we don't know that one about Dirk. Uh-huh. Jackson. There we are. Hey, folks, I, what I was going to say is Bert is really a trivia master, but I got him one time this week. What general of the army in the 20th century, early 20th century, had a colorful last name? People who attended West Point are not allowed to answer. They should know this one. Blackjack Persian. I got that one, and Bert didn't. But I'm telling you, Trivia Night with Bert is a lot of fun, so please make your plans to be here. Today is what? Pentecost. Pentecost. What do we celebrate on the day of Pentecost? The coming of the Holy Spirit. We celebrate the remembrance of when the Spirit came to those original disciples up in the upper room. But I want it to be more than just a day that we remember we remember what took place in the upper room. I want it to be a day that we ask for the Spirit to come upon us. The Holy Spirit is powerful. The Holy Spirit is amazing. Because I tell you, I challenge you to read Acts chapter 2 and read that sermon by Peter. Now I'm probably going to get in trouble for this when I die and go to the pearly gates. Peter's going to greet me there and he said, I heard what you said. I heard what you said on Pentecost in 2022. But that sermon that he gave, where 3,000 people gave their lives to Jesus Christ, was a snoozer. It wasn't that great of a sermon. But you know what? Because the Holy Spirit had blessed it. Because the Holy Spirit was there. 3,000 people gave their lives. And so today on Pentecost, and we do this every year, we have compromise. We do their Confirmation Sunday on the day of Pentecost because these are new people coming in to full and responsible membership into the church. They're giving their lives to Jesus Christ. They may have done this earlier, but they're making it official today. They're standing before you, and they're going to make their promise to be followers of Jesus Christ. So I have a scripture for you guys this morning. It's from Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. It's up on the screen. I don't even need it up on the screen. I don't need the notes because it's such an easy scripture. I've got it memorized. For me to live is Christ. To die is gain. For our young people this morning, I wanted to challenge you to find your passion. Now, 
it's not the same kind of thing that you're going to hear at your high school graduation or your college graduation because i promise you you're going to hear some speech some message either from one of your classmates or from some adult it's going to stand up there and encourage you to find your passion for life what is it you want to do how do you want to make a living how do you want to get through life and you want to do it with more than just getting by you want to have a passion well i'm talking about a different kind of passion I'm talking about the passion for jesus christ and the passion for his church that's what paul was talking about for me to live it's all about jesus everything that i do is about jesus but then when I die, it's gain. Why is it gain? Because I then am in God's kingdom. Any of the struggles of the day, any of the struggles of this life are gone. For me to live as Christ, to die is gain. But let me tell you something. There's no way that you can ever make that statement and make it for real without the power of the Holy Spirit. This kind of passion that Paul had can only come from the Spirit. Today we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. And as I said before, it's not just a day for remembering, it's a day for asking for the Holy Spirit to be in our lives. You guys are coming to be full and responsible members of the church. I'm asking you to find your passion. Find your place in what we call the body. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. The body is a unit. One unit. See, I can't do this because I have a lavalier that really doesn't sound good on the live stream, does it, folks? Sorry. The body is a unit. It's one component. But it's made up of many different parts. And if some of the parts are missing, then the unit doesn't work right, does it? Paul says it this way. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, we were all given the same spirit to drink. So I'm saying, find your part. You have a part to play, and if you don't play your part, then the body is lesser than what it should be. If you don't find your part and play it with passion, the church of Jesus Christ is less. That's not just for them, folks. That's for all of us. All of us who aren't being confirmed this morning, I would say the same words to you. Have you found your passion? Can you say with Paul, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain? You can't say it without the Holy Spirit because that's a very short sentence, but it's a big mouthful. We talk a lot about being the hands and feet of Christ here. To be the hands and feet of Christ for compromise for all the rest of us, we have to have a passion. We have to find our passion. We have to find our place in the body. And we need to do it with passion. Do you love Jesus this morning? Is there a passion in that love? You see, there's a difference between checking a box about what my religion might be, Christian and having a passion for Jesus Christ and his church. And if we have that passion for Jesus Christ and his church, we will be passionate about finding our place in the body. Will that passion ebb and flow? Absolutely. I know all of you have jobs. All of you have other things that you do. I'm lucky. I get to marry my passion to my job. Not all people, to do, people can do that. But we all still have other things in our lives. We have kids, we have grandkids, we have spouses, we have other things that can sometimes give us great stress. And sometimes that passion for Jesus and the church, it ebbs, it starts to die out. But when we begin, but when we begin that relationship with Jesus Christ with passion, when it starts to ebb, we remember. Every time this happens to me, it clicks in my brain. Oh my gosh, I'm losing something that I used to have. 
and it was so great when I had it. Because all that I did in service, all that I did as a part of the body was so fulfilling, so rewarding, because I had that passion that came from the Holy Spirit. And I want it back. Yes, the passion will ebb. But what happens when you begin that relationship with passion? That relationship with Jesus Christ and his church with passion. When it starts to ebb, you'll want it back. You'll want it back right away. Be passionate. I'm going to encourage you to be passionate in worship. Be passionate about listening to the message. Be passionate about listening to the choir. Be passionate when you are in a Bible study to listen and hear the words. I want you to do more than walk out of a Bible study or out of a sermon and go, oh, that was nice. I like that. I didn't know some of the things that the preacher said. It was interesting. No. God is speaking through the choir, through the message, through the reading of Scripture. God is speaking. The struggle is that we're not always listening. I remember when I was in college, I went to one of these Christian colleges. It was, I went there to play baseball. They were a D1 school, and they were also a very Christian school, and you had to go to church. Sometimes I tried to get out of going to church. They'd ask me, the resident advisor, the RA, would ask me, where did you go to church? Oh, I went to Bedside Baptist. Well, what do you mean Bedside Baptist? Oh, you know, Pastor Sheets, Squeaky, uh, squeaky scr uh, Spring Choir. That's hard to say. That meant that I had stayed in bed the whole morning, and I was just making an excuse. But I remember one time I was coming back from church, and there were these two guys in the hall in our residence, in the dormitory, and this, these two kids were just ripping this church that they had gone to. Oh, the message was terrible. The preacher, all he did was stare at his notes like this. And the choir, they were so out of tune, they almost sounded in tune because there was so much dissonance. And Sunday school was a waste of time. And this RA couldn't have been more than 20 years old. He's talking to these 18-year-old kids. Couldn't have been more than 20. He looked these two kids in the eye, and he said, did they read from the Bible? And the kids said, yes. He said, then why weren't you fed? Why did you get nothing out of it? And then he just turned on his heel and he walked away. You see, folks, when the word of God is present, God is speaking. God is speaking here this morning. He's spoken through the scripture that we read to begin the sermon. He spoke through the scripture about the body of Christ. He's speaking. Are we listening? God is speaking. He speaks in so many different ways. We need to make a pledge. You guys need to make a pledge. You guys need to make a pledge that you're going to try to listen for God's voice every day, every place. Listen, especially in church. Because when the God, word of God is being spoken, the word of God is being preached, the word of God is being sung, God is speaking to us. Find your passion. Find that thing that God has called you to be and to do. Because if we're not performing our job as part of the body of Christ, then the body is defective. The body is disabled. Are any of us causing the body to be less than it's supposed to be? By not finding our passion? Not finding our place in the body? Today, God is speaking. Are we listening? One of the things that some of you can do, and you say you might be able, not be able to do these, but I can promise you, you can. You might not be able to take a trip to uh, Ethiopia. You might be able to take a trip to Honduras. By the way, we have one opening. Somebody dropped out at the last minute. We have an opening in two weeks for a trip to Honduras to do some incredible medical mission work. If you want to do that, come see me. I just found about, out about this after the last service. Two weeks, though. It's short notice. You may not be able to do mission trips. But you know what a lot of you could do? 
teach Sunday school as a substitute Sunday school teacher, either at the 930 service or here at the 11. I got one of those aha moments, those epiphanies last Sunday. It was what we call family worship Sunday. And I was standing outside the office, and this family, well, mom and two kids, came up to that little table where people register for Sunday school, and she read the sign, no Sunday school, family worship. And she told her kids, and they were just incredibly disappointed. They hadn't been coming here that long, so they didn't understand that we do this on holidays and certain other Sundays. We have family worship. Now, I want to tell you this, and I want you to hear this clearly. I think family worship is a great thing. I love it. I like it to happen. I love to see young people, kids, even babies in the service. Still remember that old story about the preacher, the baby starts to cry. The mother gets up, goes to the back, the baby cries even louder. louder. And he says, ma'am, you don't have to leave. That baby's not bothering me. And she looked at him and said, you're sure bothering him. <laughs> but with family worship, I want it to be an opportunity, not a necessity. See, all too often, we have those family worship because we can't find enough Sunday school teachers. There are people in this church that God is calling you. Your calling is, your passion needs to be, your part of the body is to help equip and train the next generation to come to know Jesus Christ so that these pews will be filled every single year. There are some of you, that's your calling. That needs to be your passion. Another thing that all of us can do as part of the body of Christ is we can pray. We can pray for our church. We can pray for the mission, the missions in the world. We can pray for the ministries here in the building. We can pray for our church leaders. We can pray for our staff. And most of all, pray for your pastors. All of us. Both of us, I should say. Both of us are just like you. We don't have elevated status. Benson and I are both, both flawed and broken people who desperately need your prayers. But you can also pray for revival and awakening. Revival is what takes place in a church, and it's kind of a wake-up call for the church. Hey, church, we're not supposed to just be people who put our butts in seats. We're supposed to be doing something. We're a part of a body. We're a part of a unit. We're doing something to make a difference, to be the hands and feet of Christ. That's a revival. An awakening is when people who don't know Jesus Christ come to know him and make that profession of faith. Yes, Jesus, I love you. Yes, Jesus, I will follow you. So we need to pray for those things. Not just the kind of prayer that goes, Lord, please bring about revival or awakening. Okay, that's good. No, I mean the kind of prayer where we set aside a part of our day. Not a long part. It doesn't have to be 10 minutes. I mean, it doesn't have to be 10 hours. It can be 10 minutes, 5 minutes. But we pray with passion. We find a place in our house or our work, place of work where we can pray for revival and awakening. Do you know that throughout the 2,000-year history of the church, there have been many, many, many revivals and awakenings? But every revival, this is um, Brad Allen, from the Moravian Principle, the secret of revival, of revival. Every revival throughout history is unique. No two are exactly the same. God uses different people, different methods, and different times. However, one thing is always the same in times of revival. There have never been great revivals without great prayer. Do you love Jesus this morning? Really? If you do, you're going to pray for revival. You're going to pray for awakening. Because if you love Jesus, you love the things that Jesus loves. And you know what Jesus loves? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That's why Jesus came. That's what Jesus loves. If we love Jesus, we're going to love the things that Jesus loves. We've got to find a passion. And only the Holy Spirit can give us that passion. 
There was a man by the name of Jeremiah Lanphier in 1857, September 23rd, actually, 1857, in an old church in New York City up on the upper floor. He put a sign out in the street that said, prayer meeting from 12 to 1 o'clock. Stop by for 5, 10, or 20 minutes, or the whole hour, if your time permits. Jeremiah Lanphier waited for 10 minutes, then 10 more. Then the minute hand on his watch pointed to 12.30, when at last he heard a step on the stairs. One man came in, and then another, and another, until there were a whole six people there. They decided after the meeting was dismissed that they would meet again the next week on the following Wednesday. The small meeting was in no way extraordinary. There was no great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Lanfear had no way of knowing that right there was the beginning of a great national revival in this country where over one million people came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, whose names were written in the book of life, if you like, who now were going to be in the kingdom of God. We can all pray. And if we love Jesus, and if we love Jesus with a passion, then we will pray for revival and awakening. Bert, there's no hammer back there, is there? There's no nails? I was afraid I might get crucified for this one. I would challenge you to have a passion for giving, for being a generous giver. Want to know what the Bible says about generous giving? Well, read what Jesus says. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but one poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor woman has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she gave out of her poverty and put in everything, all that she had to live in, on. I'm not saying that God wants us to do that, to give all that we have. But I do know that God is looking for passionate Christians who will have passionate generosity in their giving. Because every time the church has had passionate giving, passionate generosity, great things have happened. You ever hear the name Joseph of Arimathea? Some of you might know that name. He was the one who claimed Jesus' body off of the cross and then buried it. But he also was the one who bankrolled the early church. The reason why the missionaries went out so quickly the reason why there was so much going on in the early church, why it was growing exponentially, is because there was a man who was generous bankrolling the church. Oh, I think it would have happened without Joseph of Arimathea, but I don't think it would have happened as quickly. God always finds a way, but I can tell you that if you want to look at the times that the church has thrived, it's when people have been generous with their giving been generous. Not just giving out of the abundance, but giving generously. Some people have told me whenever I preach a, a sermon on stewardship or giving, they say, well, Jesus never talked about the tithe. You're absolutely right. Jesus never said a word about tithing. Do you know why that is? Because his audience was all Jewish, and they were required by the law of Moses give 10% and put it in the treasury of the temple. That was already, already the requirement. Jesus, when he talked about giving, was talking about going beyond, about being generous. If you love Jesus, and you want to see people come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, be generous in your giving. Now, I want to speak to some of our seasoned citizens. I've heard many of you who will say in conversation, I am getting so tired of this RMD. You know what an RMD is? Required minimum distribution. You have to take it at 70 and a half from your IRA, and it gets larger every year. So when I hear people, claim, people complaining that they have to take it, you know what that tells me? 
They don't need the money. They don't need it at all. In fact, they're upset that they have to take it because they have to pay taxes on it. Well, I've got a win-win solution for you. Have your IRA send a check directly to the church. You don't get a tax deduction, but you don't, don't have to pay taxes on the money. You can be a generous giver that way because I know you don't want the money. I know you don't need the money because you complain about having to take the RMD. It's a win-win solution, isn't it? It's a great way. You can help the church thrive because the church does operate on money. We're no longer in the barter system. I wouldn't be happy if you tried to pay me in eggs and chickens and a cow. I have a mortgage. I have electric bills. I have taxes. I, I actually need the money. Here's a way to be generous in your giving. I think God is calling a lot of us to be passionate in our giving, to be passionate in our generosity. Why? Because we love Jesus, and we want to see the church thrive, and we want to see people come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You want to know what I'm passionate about? I'm passionate about one more. I'm passionate about this church and about one more. If you were here in 2017, I did a whole sermon series, and I used two movies. They were somewhat current at the time. Jersey Boys and Hacksaw Ridge. Anybody ever seen both of them? Uh, okay, anybody not wanting to raise their hand because you don't do that in public? Okay, Hacksaw Ridge, Jersey Boys. In Jersey Boys, they're talking... Okay. You know, this is, happens after 60. I just had one of those brain farts where I can't remember the lead singer of Jersey Boys, of Frankie Valley, Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons. They're interviewing him, asking him, what was the greatest thrill you had? Was it pulling Sherry out of the hat, the biggest hit? Was it making all those number one records? Was it making all that money? He said, no, the greatest thing was four guys under a street lamp the first time we made that sound, our sound. Well, folks, our sound is a church when we have passionate people who have found their passion, found their place in the body, found their calling. Our sound is bringing people to Jesus Christ. One more. The church was created for that purpose. And so today, when I've got these two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven, we were only supposed to have ten. That's good. We have eleven. We have one more that we have to do because the young lady is feeling under the weather. But our sound is what these guys are going to do in a minute. Do you promise? Do you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? I do. Do you promise to follow him? I do. That's the sound of the church. When people say, I accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I desire to follow him. Then the other movie that I used was Hacksaw Ridge. It's where Desmond Doss, the only conscientious objector to ever win the Congressional Medal of Honor, who every time he was getting exhausted, lowering uh, wounded soldiers over that ridge down to where they could be taken to a hospital, was he would cry out to God, one more, Lord. Help me get one more. Do we have that kind of passion in the church? The first day of Pentecost, I promise you that those disciples had that kind of passion. And that's why 3,000 people came to know Jesus. So you know my passion? That's it. My passion comes from the Holy Spirit. My prayer is that you'll find your passion, especially all of you. Let's pray. Lord God, fill us with your passion. Fill us and help us to find our place in your church. In Christ's name, amen.
essay by the time we're done. No, I'm going to give you the answer to each question, because I know you say this from the heart. Do you here in the presence of God at this congregation renew the solemn promise and vow that you made, or that was made in your name at your baptism, and if you do, say, I do. Since all of these folks were baptized as infants, they didn't make the promise, but their kids, their parents did. The next question, this is the most important. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and pledge your allegiance to his kingdom? If you do, say, I do. Do you receive and confess the, uh, the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments? And if you do, will you say, I do? Do you promise according to the grace, and by the way, that's the important word, according to the grace, God's unmerited favor, God's riches at Christ's expense. Do you promise according to God's grace given to you to live a Christian life and always remain a faithful member of Christ's holy church? If you do, say I do. I do. Good to you. Mentors, Layla Faith Allen, the Lord defend you with his heavenly grace and by his spirit confirm you in the faith and fellowship of all true believers of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Evelyn Suzanne Bond. The Lord defend you with his heavenly grace and by his spirit confirm you in the faith and fellowship of all true disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Say your middle name for me. Aniva. Okay. Catherine Aniva Cleveland. The Lord defend you with his heavenly grace and by his spirit confirm you in the faith and fellowship of all true disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. See, folks, they have middle names now. In confirmation class, they had first names. So sometimes we struggle a little bit. I got this one. Kaylee Marie Humphreys. The Lord defend you with his heavenly grace and by his spirit confirm you in the faith and fellowship of all true disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. I've done that before too. Alexis Reese Manlu, Manlucu, thank you. The Lord defend you with his heavenly grace and by his spirit confirm you in the faith and fellowship of all true disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. Lily Grace Meekins, the Lord defend you by his heavenly grace and by his spirit confirm you in the faith and fellowship of all true disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. Addison Elizabeth Plotkowski, the Lord defend you with his heavenly grace and by his spirit confirm you in the faith and fellowship of all true disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. Caleb Michael Plotkowski, the Lord defend you with his heavenly grace and by his spirit confirm you in the faith and fellowship of all true disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes, they are brother and sister. We didn't raid the Plotkowski uh, clan. Carly Cherie Pulick, the Lord defend you with his heavenly grace and by his spirit confirm you in the faith and fellowship of all true disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good, came to an easy one. Cody Stephen Scott, the Lord defend you with his heavenly grace and by his spirit confirm you in the faith and fellowship of all true disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. Aaron Michael Sergic, the Lord defend you with his heavenly grace and by his spirit confirm you in the faith and fellowship of all true disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. Confirmance, would you stand? I congratulate you. I also reiterate. Do you know what reiterate means? I say it again. That's what it means. Find your passion for Jesus Christ and his church. Find your place in the body. We are less, much less, without you than we are with you. Those who are assisting with communion, please stay here. Those who are not, you may be seated. All right. You all come up here. Right, right there is good. Do we have any others, Lisa, that are helping with communion? Okay. Bert is helping with communion. As Bird is getting our young people ready to serve communion, we're doing two things. One, we're putting on the hand sanitizer because it's still part of our regime, but we're also rubbing it into the skin enough so that when you get those first couple of pieces of bread, you don't taste hand sanitizer. It really kind of ruins the sacrament for me. But today, on this Pentecost Sunday, my prayer is that you, when you walk down this aisle, you understand the power of what is taking place. You're coming to receive the body and blood of Christ. You're coming to receive forgiveness of sins. We don't talk about that that much in the Methodist Church anymore. We used to. 
We used to talk all the time about sinning and sinners and trying to make you feel guilty for all your sins and all your sinning, trying to make you come up to the mourner's bench and weep and cry. That was not the right way to do it. Then we stopped talking about sin at all. And yet everybody here has sinned. Everybody here carries the burden of sin. And often we don't find the relief of that burden. Because we don't come expecting Jesus to meet us here. Expecting Jesus to say, you are forgiven. Put down that burden. But first we have to acknowledge that we're broken and we're sinful. That's why Benson and I need your prayers. We're just like you. But I don't want you to carry that burden any longer. As you come down this aisle, Ask for God's forgiveness. Know that you have been forgiven and put down that bag of bricks. Let's bow our heads. Lord God, I pray now, just as it was on that first Pentecost, that you pour out your spirit here today, as you did on that upper room. Pour out your spirit on each one of us, that we would know the fullness of your love, the completeness of your forgiveness, the power of passion that your spirit gives us. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take, eat this in remembrance of me. And again after the supper, he took the cup and again he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this cup represents the blood that is going to pour out of my body tomorrow. It's a blood that is for all sin. See, the Jews would have animal sacrifice in the temple to gain forgiveness for sin. Jesus is saying this blood, once and for all, is what cleanses from sin. Let's pray. Lord God, as we prepare to come, pour out your spirit. Pour out your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. The children and the choir are going to come first. Who's going to be on this one? I need two. One last thing I wanted to say before everyone receives, we have an open table. Everyone is welcome at this table. No matter if you're a Methodist or not a Methodist, no matter if you're a member of any church, you are welcomed and invited to this table. Secondly, we do have a gluten-free option for those who are gluten-free and for those who would rather just have what we lovingly call the to-go cups. Uh, we have a to-go cup for you as well. So. May God, but may God's spirit be upon us. Amen.
before we sing our closing hymn. And I think this is an appropriate way and reason to give applause. Give a round of applause for our young people who have said, yes, I choose to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Would you do that? <laughs> to all of you that I may have butchered part of your names, especially this one because I've known her since she was born. You know, it's just one of those things. I'm proud of each one of you. Today, Layla said it. Today, I'm an adult. She is. This whole confirmation concept comes from the Jewish bar mitzvah. And if you've ever been to a bar mitzvah, a young boy will stand up and say, today I am a man. In other words, today I stand before God on my own. I stood behind my parents before. These young people, today I am a woman, today I am a man. I stand before God on my own. What an incredible thing. They did a lot of work. They had some fun, I think. I think especially up in New York City, you guys had a lot of fun. I didn't go on that one. But greet them, congratulate them. They are now full and responsible members of Gainesville United Methodist Church. Let us stand for our closing hymn. Our confirmands are going to lead us out. May we be an example to them. May they be an encouragement to us to find our passion, to find our place in the body of Jesus Christ, that we serve and love him more each day. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.